And welcome to Act Three. So this is Act Three of our of our panel here. Uh, I think we're actually uh, perfectly on time, and uh, we have uh, room for discussion now. Um, if the panelists uh, themselves have questions they'd like to ask other other panelists, you know, our group can have a conversation. Um, and maybe to kind of kick it off, I do have a question here in my feed, um, which is specifically for um, Dr. Dr. Ling. Um, she's still there. <laughs> um, or we can kind of discuss, oh, there you are, sorry. I, I, I am still here, but I, I am in the forced choice of being able to hear. <laughs> oh, oh, I see, yeah. But, and yeah, David, I need your help. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> The FCC on the case. Yeah. So the question is, can you speak to the creation category as needed, such as software as a medical device? Repeat that question, please. You blurred I, I think the, the question is meant I think the question is meant to ask um, whether medical devices uh, that category might be expanded to include software or perhaps even predictive algorithms. Uh, is something that came to mind when I read the question. So, you know, it, um, the benefit, it, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I think one that we need to um, have an answer to, which I don't write <laughs> right now. I will say though, that, you know, how this actually, um, how a device is defined is, stated, um, how software is defined. And I, I believe FDA has a category for uh, software um, as a benefit category or as a category, but it doesn't clearly easily translate into the statutorily defined benefit categories for CMS. I think yeah. having the evidence of what exactly the treatment, service, or intervention is will be enormously important. So there has been, for instance, conversations about digital health, right? Digital health and digital technology. What, what exactly is meant when those terms are used? Um, CMS has enabled payment for telehealth including rem use of remote technologies under the public health emergency, the, the COVID public health emergency. So is that similar? Is that different? I think we have a challenge here of translating across not only science to practice and policy, but also one of understanding that requires clarity. Um, and I think that clarity will help us to consider whether something is close enough or is this some it, into a benefit category that exists or is it not? So that I know that feel, felt like a non-answer coming out, but I think it's the reality of the translational challenge that we face over. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it doesn't seem clear. Uh, maybe uh, that's part of the innovation is, you know, uh, having the full translational aspect, you gotta innovate also on the, the billing coding parts. Um, uh, David, David uh, Dr. Hearn, I think you had a question. I, I did. I really appreciate Sherry sharing some of the, you know, realities of Medicare billing coding historically. Uh, does, though, I wonder, Sherry, if the Medicare Advantage program uh, provides more of an opportunity for innovation in services and service delivery, since as I understand it, it's more of a value-based uh, coverage model uh, so that services can be added uh, as uh, appropriate that might add value, uh, improve quality, um, and even reduce costs too, where you could do uh, more of that kind of iteration. Is that is that true? Is that a true understanding? There, there is greater flexibility for Medicare Advantage there's greater flexibility for Medicaid um, than there is through fee-for-service Medicare. And Medicare Advantage has to, um, at, at the minimum, provide coverage that 
um, pay for service does, but they can go beyond that which is covered by way of fee for service. Um, so in fact, it is true um, that that may be an opportunity, but um, answering that without knowing, you know, what different MA plans are covering. So with that caveat. Thank you for the question though, David. Thanks, and I, I see here that Dr. Kearns has his hand uh, raised in the his window. Yeah, I, I, really, this is to talk, I really appreciate and don't want to uh, shortchange the conversation about uh, uh, hinges on Sherry and CMS. But I do have a broader question that I'd like to come back to, which is, it's my view that uh, much of our work in the pain area and the use of technology has been to use technology to, you know, provide a platform for something we already think helps. We, have, we haven't done a lot of work stepping outside the box to really think creatively about, you know, things that we maybe even can't envision now about technology and uh, pain management. Um, and so I, I, that was my point. I want to come back to it about where are the where are the opportunities there? I don't think they're largely within the typical, for example, sponsored funded, uh, sponsor initiated funding announcements where there's already an idea, something that they want. I'm thinking about Rebecca, she could react to that. Maybe that's too strong a statement. Uh, but I, 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 I um, you know, I think, uh, you know, like in my business, applying CBT and developing mobile apps or apps for smartphones or, and even virtual reality, I think. Um, and, and even the beginning uses of artificial intelligence, they seem to be just incremental steps in, in building on what we already know as opposed to creating something new. And then I guess the related question I have is about the idea of um, accepting the idea that pain is a, especially chronic high impact pain, or high impact chronic pain is complex. And, and you know, I think many of us agree that Typically, a multimodal um, approach is important. Um, where is the innovation in terms of integrating different kinds of platforms and uh, targets um, to create, you know, alternative uh, models of care? I guess is the bottom line. So that's a big picture question. I don't know if it's taking us too far afield, but that's that's really a lot of what interests me. Actually, maybe Dr. Baker, maybe. So could you respond to that or uh, how sure. would- Sure, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start by saying we do support research within the HEAL initiative and then, you know, across NIH more broadly in a lot of these categories. So we have multiple virtual reality um, type interventions that we're studying in HEAL for different types of pain. Um, and we are also, working to expose our research data and the data that we are generating um, within the HEAL initiative and that we're using within the HEAL initiative to AI, which is no small feat, like, you know, to make it AI-able. Um, but having said that, I, I think it's a great, it, it's a really important point not to just use technology to kind of perfect or optimize something that we're doing already, but to look forward and say, what could it enable us to do that we're not doing already? And from my perspective, specifically to pain, but I think you could also look at some other behavioral health conditions. You know what? People are walking around with these phones all the time. And we, you even use the term high impact chronic pain, which I think measures function. You know, how is a person's function affected by that pain? And I think that some of these digital tools would be very poised to start to address that if someone, um, and, and I've seen some really incredible preliminary data about how a, per, you know, a person's movement can reflect on aspects of their behavioral health and aspects of their pain. So I think that that, just put that out there as one example, we have a really hard time in pain knowing what works. We don't have um, a lot of biomarkers. We don't have a lot of objective measures of pain that we can, you know, in the context of a clinical study, say this intervention works because this, you know, marker was affected thusly. 
So to explore how those um, how those, these digital tools could collect data around that could really advance a, a lot of different types of research. Um, but I would also say that there's always these like privacy issues and people are rightfully very um, protective and, and nervous about those data going going beyond, you know, a, a really specific either their ownership or um, the, the um, being used in a particular research study. So I'm aware of the of the time too, Daniel, and you're jumping in. Uh, I just want to say I'm in the VA. I'm privileged to have had my most of my career in the VA, which has invested as an you know integrated system in some of these this idea of think tanks, essentially bringing people together to create new ideas and so forth. I'm I'm interested in thinking more broadly, and now's not the time, obviously. Where are is it is it mostly that we need to rely on you know our academic institutions to build divisions or you know enterprises that bring people from different walks of life together or are there or there's some other uh you know funding opportunities that we should all be thinking about or growing new opportunities um so anyway thank you for the minute of course well thank thank each of you for for participating in our panel i i enjoyed it and i felt like i learned a lot from each of you yet again so so thank you very much and I, I, we had a solid audience throughout our conversation. And so I hope everyone that was able to participate in our panel also took something helpful away. And um, so I'd just like to, to name each of you again. Thank you, Dr. Kearns, Baker, Payne, Jameson, Schlosser, Ahern, and Dr. Wing for making the time uh, to be here. And um, thanks also to the, the organizers of this program for the, the TIPS Summit and also to the sponsors that made uh, both the summit and our panel possible.